In March of 2023, four friends from Southern California went on an exploratory tour of Northwest Saudi Arabia to take a look at the evidence for Mount Sinai being located there, rather than the traditional site of Jebel Musa and the Sinai Peninsula. They were David Guzik, Chuck Musselwhite, Lance Ralston, and Miles de Benedictus. All four are pastors who have taught the Bible for many years and were curious to see if the claim made by a growing number of researchers about Mount Sinai in Arabia had merit. Their guide was Andrew Jones, who splits his time between Eastern Turkey, where he works on the Ark Project, and Saudi Arabia, furthering research in the area. The tour had a total of 15 people, including Ibrahim, a Saudi national and director of a tour agency based in Tabuk. After several days of driving and hiking in often remote areas of Northwest Saudi Arabia, the four pastors concluded that if any area can make a claim to being the location of Israel's journey through the wilderness to Mount Sinai, the region that they explored just east of the Gulf of Aqaba is most likely it. The traditional site of Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula dates to the fourth century when the Empress Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine, visited the Holy Land on a quest to visit biblical sites. She identified them from local sources claiming to know where events had transpired hundreds of years before. Once Helena announced her acceptance of a location, a church or a shrine was quickly built and became a sought after pilgrimage destination. Many of these sites remain as favored tourist destinations. Helena was told by the local Bedouins that Jebel Musa, that is the Mount of Moses at the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula, was Mount Sinai and was confirmed to her in a dream. It has been the traditional site ever since. It seems reasonable to locate Mount Sinai in the region that shares the same name. But the peninsula wasn't called Sinai until well after the mount was said to be there. Factors against this traditional site of Mount Sinai are these. Number one, the valley leading to the mount is far too small to accommodate the one to three million people who made the exodus. For purposes of our study, we'll round off to an estimated number of two million. Second, Israel spent a year camped at the base of Mount Sinai, and yet archeologists have not found any evidence of their presence in the area. Third, at the time of the Exodus, the peninsula was Egyptian territory, as evidenced by the numerous Egyptian mines in the region. After exploring the region of Northwest Saudi Arabia, the four pastors concluded that area has a far better claim to be the location of the real Mount Sinai. Here is what convinced them. Let's consider, first of all, the biblical evidence. The first evidence for the location of the real Mount Sinai is the Bible. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence for the four pastors was several passages in the early chapters of Exodus. In Exodus chapter two, we read this. Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. A bit later in chapter three, verse one, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now this is when God spoke to Moses, sending him back to Egypt to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. In verse 12, God tells Moses, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, meaning Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is another name for Sinai, as we will see. A bit further on in chapter four, we read this. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then once more in Exodus 18, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, is referred to as the priest of Midian. The region of Midian is named after, of course, the Midianites, descendants of Abraham and Keturah, 
Abraham's wife after the death of Sarah. The Midianites occupied the northwest region of the Arabian Peninsula, just east of the Gulf of Aqaba. They never occupied territory west of there, and certainly not the Sinai Peninsula. In the New Testament letter to the churches of Galatia, the Apostle Paul refers to, quote, Mount Sinai in Arabia. The biblical evidence for the location of Mount Sinai points to Saudi Arabia, specifically to the land of Midian, which has been well documented as located on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Let's consider now the possible location of the Red Sea crossing. Precisely where Israel crossed the Red Sea is another area of contention. Scholars and Bible students advocate several places. After their visit to the area, Chuck, David, Miles, and Lance came to the belief that it very well could have been from Nueva Beach in Egypt on the west side of the Gulf of Aqaba to Ras Al Hasha Beach on the Noam region on the east coast of Saudi Arabia. It was finding this location that originally sent Ron Wyatt in search of Mount Sinai in this area of Saudi Arabia. Wyatt had long suspected that Mount Sinai was in Saudi Arabia, but it was long before Google Maps and Google Earth. Exploring the area could only be done by foot, car, or airplane. Getting into Saudi Arabia at that time was almost impossible. In the early 1980s, when the Sinai was still under Israel's control, Wyatt had a small plane fly him along the west coast of the Gulf of Aqaba looking for a possible crossing place. When seen from the air, Nueva Beach appeared to Wyatt as the perfect place. He eventually snuck into Saudi Arabia where he went to the area directly across from Nueva and began scouring the area for evidence of the Exodus route. The gulf is 10 miles wide at this point, with the usually deep gulf rising to just a couple hundred meters in the passage between these two shores. Following Wyatt's initial work and suspecting this might have been the crossing point of Israel, divers have investigated the seafloor to see if any remnants remain of the Egyptian army that went after the Jews as they passed through the sea. In Exodus 14, verses 22 through 28, we read this. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. While it's entirely possible that almost 3,500 years underwater could have seen any evidence of the Egyptian army obliterated, divers have found a remarkable number of interesting objects on the bottom of the sea at this location, both at the western and eastern sides of the Gulf. Coral doesn't grow on a sandy seabed. It needs something hard to attach to, then over time covers it with incrustations that either hide or replace the original material. What divers have found on the seafloor in this area of the Gulf of Aqaba are unique coral formations. While the coral to the north and the south on both sides of the Gulf are the usual large reef structures, the coral near Nuevo Beach and Rasa Al Hasha are small colonies scattered across the bottom, many of them in the shape of what may be axles and wheels. If this was the place of the Red Sea crossing, the Israelites traveled down the Wadi Watir and became hedged in on the shore at what is now Nueva Beach, just as it says in Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. 
Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hairoth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Some years ago, a solitary 20-foot-tall granite column was discovered at Nueva Beach. Ron Wyatt claims that when he finally made it into Saudi Arabia and examined the Saudi side of the Gulf, there was a similar column there. Wyatt was arrested by the Saudis not long after that and spent 70 days in jail. The Saudis thought that he was spying for Israel. He said that he was only there to investigate the location of the real Mount Sinai. When they asked him what proof he had, he mentioned the column. Wyatt and some Saudi handlers were then flown by helicopter from the city of Hakel to the area of Rosh al-Hasha where he showed them the column. That convinced the Saudi authorities that Wyatt was not spying for Israel, but was doing archaeological research. He was allowed to leave the country and rejoin his family. Later visits to the area by others found no column and its current location remains unknown. Local Bedouins claim that there was a column there for decades. They differed on their stories of what happened to it. Some said that the Saudis buried it, while others said that it was hauled offshore and sunk. The origin of the column at Nueva Beach is a mystery. The granite that it's made from is not found in the immediate area. It was transported from many miles away. Its style is reminiscent of older Egyptian columns rather than later Greece. Some researchers propose that Israel's King Solomon erected them on both shores of the Gulf to commemorate Israel's exodus by marking the location of the Red Sea crossing. Solomon was active in that same area as recounted in 1 Kings chapter 9 and 2 Chronicles chapter 8. It was on the Gulf of Aqaba that he built Israel's merchant fleet. In 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, we find this. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. The parallel passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 2, narrows it down even further. Work on the temple commenced on the second day of the second month. This yields a date for the Exodus of 1445 BC and hints at the idea that Solomon was interested in Israel's history. It may very well be that he was the one to erect the pillars at the places that Israel crossed the sea. He did have special columns made for the temple in Jerusalem. You can refer to 1 Kings chapter 7. Though the column that Ron Wyatt claimed to have found on the Saudi shore of the Gulf is missing, the one at Nueva Beach is still there, adding credence to Wyatt's claim. Let's consider now the evidence of the land of the Midianites, which was Jethro's home. Our next clue to Mount Sinai was the location of Midian. Archaeologists and historians are universal in their view that the Midianites lived in the northwest region of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Abundant archaeological evidence of their presence on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba has been uncovered, while none has been found in the Sinai Peninsula. As we already noted in the biblical evidence, when Moses fled from Egypt in the earlier phase of his life, he went to the land of Midian where he became the son-in-law of a man named Jethro, identified as a priest of Midian. Moses' occupation there was a shepherd who led Jethro's flocks throughout the area for 40 years. During that time, he would have ranged far and wide across the land in search of adequate pasture. Typical of shepherds, Moses knew where reliable water sources were located. Taking his flock on an extended foray, he found himself in the back of the desert at Horeb, the mountain of God, as Exodus 3 verse 1 describes it. It was there that God met him in the form of a burning bush that was not consumed. God commissioned Moses to lead the deliverance of Israel from bondage in Egypt and says this in verse 12, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. 
When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Knowing that the Midianites occupied the northwest region of Saudi Arabia on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, and that their shepherds would lead their flocks within the borders of their own territory, strongly suggests Mount Sinai is located there. The area around the modern city of Al-Bad in Saudi Arabia holds abundant evidence of a major Midianite occupation at the time of Moses. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, is presented as a significant figure in Midianite society. He may have lived where Al-Bad is today. This mount on the outskirts of Al-Bad is called Atel, an ancient city now lying in ruins and covered by soil. It's been fenced off for future excavation, though the fence is in disrepair, allowing access to explorers. One can find abundant evidence this was once a thriving city. These tombs are located not far from the Tell. They are Midianite and give evidence of a sophisticated settlement in this area. This well and the structures around it suggest that this was a source of water for a large community. Local tradition going back centuries regards it as the well that we read about in Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Is this well the well of Exodus 2? Local tradition says that it is. After crossing the Red Sea, the book of Exodus tells us that Israel traveled through the wilderness of Shur from oasis to oasis. In Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 and 23, and then verse 27, we find this. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea when they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees, and so they camped there by the waters. There are no places in the region known as Mara and Elam today, but there are some oases that may be these ancient camping places of Israel as they made their way through the area. One that we visited was Tayyib al Izm, reached by a narrow valley from the coast that strikes east and then broadens into a wide valley granting access to the mountain range known as Jabal al-Laz, in which Mount Sinai is located. Another notable oasis is Magna, a little further down the coast from Tayyib al Izm. Multiple springs bubble out of the ground at Magna, supporting a large oasis. Here at Magna, uh, it is a coastal oasis, but it has a very strong tradition that Moses was here with the Israelites. And so it's known um, to you know, old ancient times as the springs of Moses, or Ayin Musa. And you can see the springs here. Now, some of the tradition has that there used to be 12 springs. And so for some people, this is Elam with the 12 wells or the 12 springs. Uh, for other people, this is the coastal oasis with Numbers 33, because it says after they left Elam, Numbers 33 lists all the camping sites from Goshen to the Promised Land. And it says after they left Elam, they camped on the Red Sea. So that actually gives you a hint on the direction of travel. They're not going inland, they're following the coast, either north or south. So if you take a southern route going to Mount Sinai, then this would be, maybe that will be your coastal campground here. Because remember, they don't complain about lack of water until Rephardim. So where they're going throughout their um, journey on the Exodus route, up to Rephardim, they had water. Um, whether it's bitter, you know, like at Mara. Um, and now right across the valley from this big oasis is an ancient archaeological site. It's fenced off, you can see it over there. And the Saudi archaeological literature mentioned a lot of uh, midnight pottery being found over here. So you have an ancient fortress guarding the water source 
plenty of land around here for the Israelites to encamp. Beautiful coastal area. Um, now in the 1700s, so before YouTube, um, an Ottoman cartographer came through here making maps and he was told that nearby was the rock that Moses struck and water came out. And in the 1900s, early 1900s, Musel, a Czech explorer, he came through here. He was like a Catholic, uh, trying to uh, match, um, check out the different sites in Midian. And he had, was told the same story in the 1906 or 7. In the 1950s, um, Philby, a British explorer, he came through here and he was told the same thing. It is only 12 miles from Tayyib al Isim to Magna, a day's journey by foot. From Tayyib al Isim to Refadim, is 30 miles, a journey of two to three days and easily made by connecting wadis. But there are no oases beyond Tayyib al Isim, leading to Israel's need for water and what happened next in the story. In Exodus, we read this. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses, and said, Give us water, that we may drink. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The result was an abundance of water sufficient to meet the needs of the entire camp. Note that God directed Moses to the rock in Horeb. An important piece of information is needed at this point. When we speak of a certain mountain, we usually mean a specific peak. But people of the ancient Middle East did not think of that. When the Bible refers to Horeb as the mountain of God, think mountain range rather than a specific peak. The term Southern California refers to a region, not just the cities of Los Angeles or San Diego. The Mediterranean Sea is a vast area, not just the waters of the French Riviera. Horeb wasn't a single peak. It was a range of peaks today known as Jabal Allahs, of which one peak was Mount Sinai. There was likely a unique rock feature at the base of the Horeb range that Moses knew of because he'd led his father-in-law's flocks into the area. When God spoke to him about the, quote, rock in Horeb, unquote, Moses knew precisely where God meant and led the people there. Now, it's an arid area with no springs. God intended to do something remarkable that would both send the message that he would take care of the people and that Moses was the one that he chose to lead them. As God had said, when Moses struck the rock of Horeb with a staff, water flowed in abundance for the people. After driving off-road for quite a distance, we visited a unique rock feature that may very well be the split rock of Rephidim. Such a feature is not completely unique, but it is rare. Two factors conspired to persuade that this site was indeed the biblical Rephidim. First, was the expansive wadi that leads from the west to the base of the split rock. Now keep in mind, wherever Israel camped had to accommodate some two million people. The wadi leading from their oasis hopping to the west to the split rock was quite wide and could easily accommodate a group the size of Israel. The second factor was the presence of massive water erosion below the split rock, evidence that water had indeed flowed in that area. Now, others who have visited the site understandably take pictures of the split rock. It's a wondrous site, even if it isn't Rephidim. 
but if it is the place where water flowed, there has to be evidence of water erosion. The pastors were eager to investigate the site to see if there was evidence of such, and much to their delight, there was. At the base of the hill, topped by the split rock, is evidence of significant water erosion that happened rapidly over a relatively short period of time. The arid nature of the region means that though some 3,500 years have passed, the evidence has been preserved, not obliterated by the ravages of time and storm. Just over my shoulder is the very prominent rock here in what is most likely the place called Horeb. Exodus chapter 17 says that the children of Israel came to the rock in Horeb as they were coming to a place called Rephidim. It is the place where the children of Israel did not have water. Our guide has told us that there are no clear evidence of springs in this area like there are in many of the other locations around here. Just to my left or a little bit to the east is Jabal Alawaz, which is the range of mountains where Jabal Makla, which is believed to be Mount Sinai by those that believe Sinai is in this area, is at. So the children of Israel came and they camped in Rephidim, Exodus chapter 17 says, and they didn't have any water. And so Moses went to God and God told him to take the staff in his hand and go and strike the rock that is in Horeb. This is a very prominent rock. And the passage of scripture says that the rock split and water came forth from the rock and the children of Israel got water from there. And it is a huge split rock here in this place. And could very well be that Moses stood somewhere right near here and split the rock and provided water where all that unusual erosion is, as noted by Pastor Lance. Uh, it's a remarkable sight, and in so many ways it fits the biblical record of Rephidim. While Israel was camped at Rephidim, Exodus 18 tells us that a nomadic group called the Amalekites attacked the outer fringes of Israel's camp. As we already said, the wadi leading to Rephidim was long and wide, allowing the people of Israel to spread out. The Amalekites took advantage of this by going after those on the edge of the camp. What may have attracted them in the first place was the report of a new stream in the area. While nomadic people own no land, they claim the rights to wells in their region. And they may have claimed that now that abundant water was flowing from the split rock, well, it was theirs by right of long control of the area. Whatever their claim, Joshua led the men of Israel in a successful campaign of turning back the attack as Moses stood on one of the many hills overlooking the wadi, praying for God's favor as we read about in Exodus chapter 17 verses 8 through 13. The very next chapter, Exodus chapter 18, says that before Israel left Rephidim for the last leg of their journey to Mount Sinai, Moses' father-in-law Jethro came to him, bringing Moses' wife and two sons. This confirms the fact that all of this took place in northwest Arabia on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba in the land of the Midianites. Jethro was close enough that he could meet up with Moses at Rephidim. Today, it is only 25 miles and a relatively easy journey from Al-Bad, the likely location of Jethro's home, to Rephidim, a two-day trip at most. No route from Rephidim to Mount Sinai is given in the book of Exodus. The shortest route through the wadis that interlace the area is about 22 miles. When Ron Wyatt originally investigated the area, a primary concern in his search was locating a peak in the Jabal Allah's range before which a plain large enough to accommodate a couple million people could be found. The few maps available to Wyatt identified only one location. 
the plain that stretches to the east from the peak known locally as Jabal Makla. Wyatt went to investigate, and what he found commended itself as the real Mount Sinai. The peak and the Jabal Allah's range, a growing number of people are coming to believe is the real Mount Sinai, is called Jabal Makla. Even it isn't a solitary peak, but three summits all within a short distance of each other along the ridge that forms the continental divide for Saudi Arabia. We present Jabal Makla here in the video because we wanted to track the route of the Exodus first. Our visit to the Mount took place the day before the tour officially began. The reason why is because that was the day anyone who wanted to hike up the mountain would be able to do so. It was an arduous affair and took the entire day. The adventure began at the city of Tabuk. We took new roads that are even now being constructed in what has only recently been called the Nome region of Saudi Arabia. The country has embarked on a massive building project that will include a floating industrial complex, a global trade hub, tourist resorts, and a futuristic smart city called The Line, all powered exclusively by renewable energy sources. The infrastructure for all of this is being built now, mainly in many new roads, several of which we use to access the places that previous explorers to the area didn't have. The paved road leading to our base camp at Jabal Makla turned into a dirt road only about 100 yards short of the turnoff to our camp. We arrived there late afternoon the day before our hike up the mount. There was a strong wind that had forced the provider of the expedition to relocate our tents to a more sheltered spot. We stayed warm in a Bedouin tent heated by two charcoal fires, enjoyed a traditional Saudi meal, and listened as Andrew Jones, our guide, shared the story of how Ron Wyatt and others explored the area from the early 1980s until today. We rose early the next morning to a glorious sunrise, casting its light on the face of Jabal Makla. Anticipation of the climb of the mount began to grow. All right, so I'm standing here in front of, behind me over there is the mountain, the series of peaks called Jabal Makla. And this is an alternative site that has a lot of credibility for being Mount Sinai the place where Moses had his father-in-law's flocks, the place where Israel came and camped out and lived for more than a year here and received the law, uh, where the Ten Commandments were spoken by God audibly down to the people, uh, where they were prohibited from coming up, and where later on in the Bible, Elijah came. There's a cave up there that we're gonna take a look at later on, it's supposed to be Elijah's cave. But the important thing is that this is a credible site. There's controversy about this. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the traditional site is over on the Sinai Peninsula. We are on the Saudi Arabian side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And it has to do with where did Israel cross the Red Sea? It has to do with what is the most logical route. It has to do with where the Midianites were because we know that Moses' father-in-law was a Midianite. And we know that the Midianites were in uh, a close geographical uh, region to Mount Sinai. There's a lot to recommend this particular site. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a hike up to the peak, assuming we can make it, up to the top of that peak and to take a good look around and to see what we can find investigate the cave if we can. This is a spot that up until just a few years ago has really been restricted. It started to be investigated and discovered in the early 1980s. And up until just a few years ago, it's been very restricted, but now it's much more open. We're here with a recognized tour group to come take a look at it. We made sandwiches and filled bottles with water for the climb, packed our bags, tightened our laces, and then loaded into the vehicles to drive a short distance as far as the road could take us. We then began our hike across a plain to the base of the mount. Just a few hundred yards later, we came to a downed fence. 
Years ago, when interest in the region as the location of Mount Sinai began to grow, Saudi officials erected a razor wire topped fence around the entire base of the mountain. At some point, a storm knocked down a large section allowing access. Andrew, our guide, then led us a half a mile across the plain to the very base of the mount. It was there we came upon the ruins of an ancient structure. The layout and location suggested this was the altar of Moses described in Exodus chapter 24, verse 4. There we read, Moses rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. One section of the ruins suggests an animal pen. Andrew informed us that excavations at what appeared to be an altar revealed a thick layer of ash, something expected at an altar. An additional element suggesting that this was the location of the altar that Moses built was a nearby spring, the only one in the area. Priests were required to engage in extensive purification rites before offering sacrifices. The presence of the spring not more than 20 yards away seems to cinch that location as the place of Moses' altar. As mentioned in verse 4 of Exodus 24 are the 12 pillars that Moses erected as representatives to Israel's 12 tribes. Supremely curious was the abundance of obviously quarried and shaped white marble scattered over the ground in this location. Several round pieces suggest they were once part of columns. Equally curious is the presence of marble in this area. The Jabal Allah's range is a highly weathered granite of a medium brown color. There are also occasional outcroppings of dark gray basalt. Now these are igneous rocks. Marble is a metamorphic rock and does not occur within igneous formations such as those composing the Allah's range. Yet near the summit of Jabal Makla, there is a marble deposit that bears much evidence of having been quarried. While an analysis comparing the quarry and the white marble rocks scattered over the location of Moses' altar has yet to be done, the material does look to be the same. If the shaped white marble stones at the base of the mount did not come from the quarry near the summit, they had to have been transported from a great distance. It is possible that the stones scattered liberally across the ground at Moses' altar are remnants of the twelve pillars that he erected. Another theory is that Solomon, who erected memorial pillars on the west and east sides of the Gulf of Aqaba to commemorate the Red Sea crossing, didn't stop there in his attempts to link Israel to its past. Living less than 500 years after the Exodus, the route that Israel took through the wilderness may still have been known, along with the location of the real Mount Sinai. Some believe that the ruins at the base of Mount Sinai originally were Moses' altar, but the site fell into disrepair after Israel moved on. Solomon then returned and rebuilt the site as a memorial to the national covenant that God had made with Israel there at the mount. The ascent of Jabal Makla begins immediately after Moses' altar, which is located at 5,100 feet in elevation. The summit of the mount is 7,500 feet. The route from the altar to the summit is an elevation gain of 2,400 feet and just shy of two miles. There is no trail, and the route in many places is quite steep, over and through large boulders. With more visitors to the area wanting to make the hike, a trail may one day be made, but it will take a lot of work and even then will not be an easy climb. But it was worth it. From a vantage point, halfway up the first slope, looking back down to Moses' altar, the outline of the site became clear and stood out as an interesting feature. That vantage point also revealed the vast open plain lying directly east of the mountain. It was now easy to see how the entire camp of Israel could be gathered around the foot of the mount. At a little over 6,000 feet, we crested a ridge and came out on a relatively wide and flat area. This may be where the events of Exodus 24 occurred. There we read, verse 1, Now God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, 
and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Verse 9, Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mount and be there. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. While no specific mention of a plateau part of the way up the mount is given in this passage, such a place for 73 must have been there. The steepness of the slopes both before and after the plateau on Jabal Makla would not have served as a place for such a large group to wait. Andrew, our guide, knew that someone had placed a shofar in a protected space between some rocks on the plateau and went to retrieve it, then replaced it after we had a little fun, embarrassing ourselves trying to make it sound. Rising above the little plateau was another long, steep ascent to reach that darkened rock that covers the ridge of the peaks in the area. We carefully made the ascent to the first of the three hillocks that form the summit of Jabal Makla. We were all quite curious to examine the dark rocks that make up the top of the ridge. What we found was a bit of a mystery, not only for those who made the hike, but for geologists. The dark rock making up the summit of Jamal Makla is basalt, usually a dark gray rock with a rough, grainy texture. The basalt that caps the Jabal Makla ridge has an unusual coating on the exterior of the rock that appears as a layer that shines with an iridescent glow reminiscent of mother of pearl. One can see this coating where the rock has fractured. So this rock is really strange. Look how shiny it is here. It's, it's basalt is, is dark. It's not black, but it's dark and tends to be kind of grainy unless it's wet. It's wet, yeah. But, but basalt, this is, when but, you see basalt up around Galilee, yeah. it doesn't look like this. No, it doesn't look like this. It often has a lot of porous, porous yeah. holes in it, right? Yeah. And, and that's a coating on the outside of the rock. See that right there? Yeah. There's a little ridge in and underneath the brown. You see that? So that means, that suggests this is some kind of a coating. Something happened to the exterior of the rock. Now, if the presence of God is here on the top of the mountain in fire for a year, could have baked these rocks. Attempts to identify what caused this coating have proven fruitless as there has been little geological research to date. The little that has been conducted disagrees as to the composition and potential cause of what happened to the basalt of the summit. One view is that the coating is a unique form of iron oxide. Now, iron usually oxidizes to a red color. Think of rust and you get the idea. The vast red sands that cover most of Saudi Arabia are a classic example of this red form of iron oxide. But iron oxide formed at a high temperature fuses as black and may account for the rind that appears on the exterior of the basalt on Jabal Makla. In Exodus 19, verse 18, we read, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. High temperature from this fiery manifestation of God's presence may account for the blackened rind coating on the basalt of the Jabal Makla summit. Those who object remind us that God's appearance to Moses at the burning bush 40 years before did not see the bush consumed, so there's no need to conclude that the fire on Mount Sinai burnt the rocks. And we agree. We're not bound to that conclusion, but it doesn't mention only fire. It says the mount was wrapped in smoke as if from a furnace, suggesting this manifestation of God's presence was different than at the burning bush. We hope that further geological study will narrow down the cause of the unusual coating on the rocks of the summit. Another feature suggesting that Jabal Makla is Mount Sinai is the presence of a small cave 850 feet above Moses' altar. 
Andrew Jones said that it is the only cave to be found in the extensive Jabal Allah's range. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we find this. So Elijah arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. Some of our party, including David Guzik and Miles de Benedictus, climbed up to the cave. It was a steep and difficult ascent. While the cave was not deep, it would provide temporary shelter for a night or two. That was great. What do you think, Miles? I'm fairly convinced. How about it, you? It certainly feels right. You know, of course, there's an archaeological and scientific aspect to it, but then there is something of just a, uh, you, you know, the sense when you read the scriptures, would the place have been like this? And uh, it matches up with that description for sure. Before making the ascent to Elijah's cave, the group investigated the several ancient wells in the plain that lies before Jabal Makla. These wells lie along the edge of the stream that flows from the mount. While there is no mention of wells in the Exodus account of Israel's time at Mount Sinai, it stands to reason that since they spent a year there, they would have dug them in places they knew that water was likely to be found. One provocative find, located just over a mile from Moses' altar and the foot of the mount, was a mound of flat-topped boulders on which are found numerous petroglyphs, that is, man-made carvings into the rocks. The forms depict people, ibexes, and an abundance of cows. Petroglyphs were made by scratching through the dark brown desert varnish on the exterior of the pink granite that makes up the area. The desert varnish is the result of centuries of oxidation and wind-blown sand grains that polish the surface of the rock. Any sharp object is able to scratch it, exposing the lighter rock underneath. Of note among some of the cow petroglyphs is an Egyptian-style curved horn, famously applied to their goddess Hathor. The mound is monumental in both size and location sitting as it does at the junction of two arms of the plain in front of the mount, with the summit of Jabal Makla perfectly framed by ridges. Could this be the site of what we read about in Exodus 32, when the people asked Moses' brother Aaron to make an idol for them to worship? Aaron took a huge offering of gold from them to make a calf which he then made an altar to. While this could have been anywhere with no evidence remaining till today, verse 19 says, and so it was, as soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. Wherever the altar was that Aaron had built for the golden calf, it had to be high and large enough for Moses to have seen it as he approached the edge of the camp. The site that we investigated in the plain before Jabal Makla is easily seen from the base of the mount a mile away. Now, this doesn't prove that the site was where the Golden Calf Altar was, but it is one more piece of evidence that, when combined with all the others, suggests the Jabal Makla is Mount Sinai. Following the debacle with the Golden Calf, Moses instructed the men of his tribe to take swords and slay those who'd been wildly worshipping the Golden Calf. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 28, we find this. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Apparently, this purge didn't take out all the guilty. In verse 35, we read that God dealt with those who got away. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. How many fell in this plague, in addition to the 3,000 of verse 28, isn't given but it's likely that all the bodies of those who died would be considered especially unclean 
and so removed to a distance well outside the borders of Israel's camp. Well, it just so happens that there is a massive graveyard four miles north of Jabal Makla as the crow flies, five and a quarter miles by foot, as one has to follow the wadis and washes that lace the area. What's remarkable about this mass graveyard is that it's in the middle of literally nowhere. There are no ancient settlements nearby, none. Nomadic tribes have roamed the region for centuries, but their groups are small in number, a couple dozen people. Judging by the number of rectangular plots in the graveyard, thousands were buried there. The evidence of its date points to the Bronze Age, the very time of the Exodus. The way the graves are constructed and laid out suggests the burials took place at the same time. That there are so many burial plots seen in this aerial shot, one would expect there to be a sizable settlement nearby that existed for many generations. That there is no evidence of such points to the once nearby presence of the camp of Israel and their need to bury their dead after the debacle of the golden calf. Located among the stones that make up the rectangular plots and standing headstones are numerous grinding stones that the women use to make flour. They seem out of place in a cemetery, but it turns out they prove that it is an ancient burial ground. People were often buried with personal items, and few items were more personal to a woman than her grinding stone, which over time bore the evidence of her diligence in providing for her family as its depth increased. The presence of these grinding stones in the graveyard bear evidence of the number of women who'd been a part of the worship of the calf idol. Though the graveyard at first seems a minor evidence of the location of Mount Sinai, its size turns out to be a major factor bolstering Jabal Makla's claim to being the real Mount Sinai. No testing has yet been done on the contents of the graves. Radiocarbon analysis could quickly determine the age of the remains. Despite the evidence supporting Jabal Makla as the real Mount Sinai, there are plenty of critics who maintain that the traditional site at Jabal Musa in the Sinai Peninsula is the mount. Some critiques of the Saudi Arabian location appear quite scholarly, and their arguments ought not be taken lightly. Still, all in all, both locations depend on a significant amount of assumption because, to date, the history is uncertain. The main problem lies in nailing down places that the Bible names, but the precise locations of those labels have been lost to time. In the end, we have to take a look at what is clear from Scripture and what evidence is to be found on the ground. After having had a chance to personally investigate the discoveries of intrepid explorers over the last 40 years in Saudi Arabia, Chuck, David, Miles, and Lance conclude that if there is any place that has a claim for being the real Mount Sinai, it's Jabal Makla and the Jabal Allah's range on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba.